Welcome to this video on innate immune defenses. When we use this word innate, we're talking about an ability that you're born with. So this doesn't have to develop from exposures. Um, healthy babies should immediately be able to have these defenses at work, although they're not as strong as they would be in an adult. So that's what this word innate means. You were born with it, baby. And the real difference then that we should consider is we need to compare this with adaptive immunity. And we'll be talking about that in um, a couple, just a couple pages farther in our notes. Adaptive immune defenses, those take time to develop and they only occur after exposure to a pathogen. After exposure to a particular pathogen. Um, specifically, their T and B lymphocytes are the driving cells for adaptive immunity, and all the other white blood cells are associated with innate immunity, although they might have a role to play in adaptive. Okay, so that's our background, and now I'm going to give you the different kinds of innate immune defenses. So they can be divided into a few different categories. First, they can be physical or external barriers, like unbroken skin and mucous membranes. Or they can be chemical and internal barriers, and that would be things like inflammation, antimicrobials, and um, something called complement. And then the third category that we'll put on this page will be cellular fighters. So we've highlighted all of those in yellow. Your innate def immune defenses can be boiled down to three different um, categories, physical, external barriers, chemical, internal barriers, and cellular uh, forces, basically, different kinds of white blood cells. Okay, so let's go ahead then and start with the physical and external barriers. We'll use a black pen and then highlight in green. So the first one I'll show you is hair. So yeah, your hair is important to prevent infection, whether it's the hair on your head, the hair in your armpits, pubic hair, or the hair in your nose, or the hair in your ears. It all helps to say, stay away. So microbes actually might not even get to the surface of your skin thanks to that hair. Um, the next one, well, sorry, we'll highlight this in green. The next, uh, physical barrier that I'll highlight is um, earwax. So anytime you have a wax or a mucus, it's going to be beneficial in uh, trapping and preventing pathogens from getting inside. So it catches and traps pathogens. And then similarly, um, mucus, I'm drawing it here coming out of the nose, but mucus is also on all of your mucous membranes inside your body. And again, this is going to serve a similar function to earwax to trap and inhibit pathogens. It's runnier in nature than earwax. It's actually, uh, mucin is a protein that when it meets with water, it swells up and forms the gel that you would recognize as mucus. So here we can, drops of mucus there. Okay, then um, let's go ahead and add some, here I'll use a blue pen, and let's have some saliva coming out of this person's mouth. Now I'm switching back to my black pen to write saliva. And what I think is particularly cool about saliva is like most bodily secretions, it contains an enzyme called lysozyme that is able to damage the cell wall of bacteria. So we'll highlight that in green. Now we can go over to this side of the head and 
Um, oils are produced all over on our skin and they're important for two reasons. Number one, they're going to lubricate the skin to keep it from cracking, which could allow pathogens in, but they also contain antimicrobial fatty acids. And then we'll highlight oils in green. And let's get your blue pen and have some tears coming out of this guy's eyes. Tears are um, another bodily secretion that is able to inhibit pathogens, and it does so in two ways. Number one, we all know our tears are salty, and so that is going to put osmotic stress on pathogens that have a hard time living in a salty environment because it makes them lose water. And um, also lysozyme. So if you put together um, lysozyme that damages their cell walls so that they can't um, keep the water in as well, and then, and then you put that salt on them, then the water is going to leave the cells and um, hopefully kill the pathogens. So let's go ahead and put this in green. Okay, now uh, we'll talk about stomach acid right here. So stomach acid has a very low pH, not surprisingly, and that low pH damages most bacterial cells. There are certainly some kinds of pathogens like H. pylori that can live in an acidic environment and Listeria monocytogenes is also um, capable of surviving through the stomach. So let's put some hydrochloric acid in here. It's the cells of the stomach that actually make this acid. Cells make, and they're parietal cells, so they make um, the hydrochloric acid. And you might remember from anatomy and physiology too that this hydrochloric acid is important in activating pepsin, uh, which is an enzyme that helps to start the breakdown of proteins in the stomach. But it also serves the purpose of inhibiting uh, pathogens. So the low pH uh, damages most pathogens. And that's why there was rising concern. It's pretty well understood now that it's not a good idea to take antacids if you really, really don't need them because by decreasing the amount of acidity in your stomach, you make your defenses a little bit less. And there could be some more subtle effects. Like let's say someone doesn't get really bad diarrhea because they don't have enough acid, but maybe now they start to get an imbalance in the flora in their gut. And then that could have more subtle um, health effects. And those sorts of things are uh, being researched um, these days. Okay, so now let's move down to this little uh, lady right here. She's going on a run. And let me tell you, she's going on a run, so she is going to sweat from those hairy armpits. And cool, Not only cool herself off, but that sweat is important in helping to prevent disease. So sweat is another bodily fluid that contains lysozyme. And like a tear, it's salty. So very similar to tears. It's salty and it contains lysozyme. And we'll also use this running gal to um, point out that basically your best physical barrier against disease is unbroken skin. And that's why band-aids are important. It's why it's important to clean wounds because uh, even a a three-year-old understands that if they have an, an owie, that that could get infected. Well, I guess I don't know if all three-year-olds would understand that, but mine did, but maybe it was because I always told them that. <laughs> so unbroken skin is uh, your primary um, physical defense against pathogens, and that's why... Oh, and I was also going to say that that oil on the skin helps keep your skin supple, and that is going to also help prevent... Uh, it cracking. So uh, the skin is normally fairly dry and pathogens, especially fungus, like a wet environment. So just that dryness is useful. Uh, but then it's not so dry that it cracks. The oil keeps it supple. 
And this is why if someone maybe is washing their skin or their baby's skin too often, it can actually damage the ability of the skin to have its normal flora, and then that can lead to different kinds of skin uh, infections. So that's my third point I want to make, is that the normal flora, that means the normal microbes, um, help to prevent pathogen colonization. And, you know, there's always opportunistic pathogens on your skin, like different kinds of fungus. But as long as they don't overgrow, they don't cause disease. So just keeping their numbers down and having everybody only have a certain amount of, of the opportunistic pathogen is going to help prevent disease. So here I want to point out that there's normal flora on our skin. And then let's also, while we're at it, put an arrow down here to these normal flora that are on this mucous membrane. So I'm gonna use purple for um, these bacteria. Uh, maybe that means I'm drawing lactobacillus, which is gram positive, but you can just imagine lots of different normal flora, the microbes that are in your gut. And um, that brings me to the other primary uh, defense, uh, it's a physical barrier, is going to be healthy mucous membranes. So I'm gonna, write that right here under this mucous membrane. Healthy mucous membranes. We can hear Pippin having a drink. So my poor Pippin, he's my Australian shepherd, he um, has had a relapse of what's called autoimmune meningitis, and that would be a whole video to explain it. But one of the treatments for it is just something as simple as prednisone, which is a steroid. And so when he's on that, it makes him really, really hungry and it makes him drink all the time. So he drinks lots and lots of water and then has to go pee in the middle of the night. Poor guy. Well, poor me too, right? I have to go take him out. Okay, so let's this healthy mucous membranes, and I want to remind you of where we find those in the body. So there are basically five important mucous membranes. The first one covers your eye, your conjunctiva. And you can go back up to where the tears are um, in containing lysozyme, and that the tears help to keep that mucous membrane um, from becoming infected. But that's why if it gets too dried out, like let's say on a windy day, someone can get conjunctivitis um, or maybe even pink eye if they start to not have that protective mucous membrane uh, doing what it should do. And then the let's see if you can remember these. Could you go along with me? So if I told you the respiratory tract, then what would you immediately think of next? Probably the GI tract. Mucous membrane. And then could you think of the urinary tract? And then there's one more. And hopefully you can come up with the reproductive tract. So in males, um, these two are combined uh, because the penis has the urethra as well as it's that that's the passage for semen. But in females, you're, they're going to have a separate urethra and vagina. And that brings me to my next point. So get the blue pen again. And the urine is very acidic, and so are vaginal secretions. In fact, nobody could ever get pregnant if semen weren't very alkaline because it's so acidic in here that the sperm would never be able to survive ordinarily. And so semen um, has to have a lot of alkalinity in it to help enable those sperm to survive. So then I'm going to use my black pen and then just add that the urine and um, vaginal, so this is going to be a low pH, and same with vaginal secretions right here. So these both have a low pH, and then we'll highlight that in green. So urine and then vaginal secretions. Okay, so we're ready to move on now to the second half of these notes. Um, this is going to be on uh, the chemical and internal barriers. So starting here, um, I will first tell you the different types. So first will be inflammation. So you could use a black pen to write inflammation. So that's an important part of the innate immune system. 
And then if you can take your blue highlighter and highlight it, and then your blue pen and put a nice box around that. So inflammation, and then scoot your paper down a little bit. And these are supposed to represent antimicrobials galore. So uh, what I mean by that is your body makes so many antimicrobials. And um, that word galore, tons of them, a plethora of antimicrobials. So that's going to be the second sort of chemical slash internal barrier that I'll talk about. And then um, complement. And that's a funny word that basically means many chemicals working together complement one another in their final job of fighting pathogens. So I'm going to highlight that in blue and then put a box around it. Oops, sorry, blue box. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through these. So inflammation, right here you have a blood vessel. And uh, my classic blood vessel, I'm showing some endothelial cells that when they become leaky or, and that's what inflammation is all about, water is allowed to leave. And so water and um, white blood cells leave the blood vessels. and enter the tissues. And then they're able to bring nourishment and fight disease. And that is what inflammation is all about. So inflammation is when blood vessels become leaky and allow more water to leave than normal. So bringing more fluids and white blood cells. And I'll put WBCs for white blood cells to the wound, if it's an injury, or the infection site. And then here, um, using your blue highlighter, I'm showing here would be like a white blood cell that came into the tissue, left the bloodstream and went into the tissue to fight. And then maybe we should also put here, so this is the blood vessel. Okay, then next, um, antimicrobials. I'm going to use my orange highlighter and just sort of outline these. These are things like fatty acids and little peptides. So my orange pen, uh, short chain, meaning they're really short as opposed to long chain. Short chain fatty acids can be antimicrobial. And peptides, that means either really small proteins or protein fragments. And they have a variety of ways that they can disrupt um, the cell integrity of a pathogen and mess up their function. And interestingly, they are um, made a lot of the times by your epithelial cells in your mucous membranes. So they're often made by epithelial cells. And then maybe not so surprising that they're also often made by white blood cells. Okay, next up, complement. So I'm gonna use my blue highlighter and these are all little um, peptides and chemicals that are normally circulating in the blood. I'm gonna use my black pen here. So this is a group of circulating peptides, again, meaning they're really tiny. They're usually, most of them are made from the liver. And when they are activated, they sort of join hands and come together. They stick, they make like a hole in the cell membrane of a pathogen, and then they um, mess up the cell membrane function. So when activated, form a membrane attack complex. Don't you love that? Membrane attack complex. It reminds me of a show I used to watch when I was a kid called Voltron, 
where they were there were these different like kids that flew different robots and then all the robots would come together to make one giant um robot called voltron that fought the evil um evil in the universe so this represents when they're activated and all these chemicals come together like doom, 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 and pop a hole in the cell membrane of, um, whoops, cell membrane of a pathogen. And when they do that, then water can rush in um, and uh, then lyse the cell. So, um, and if there's enough of these, especially, then the water will actually cause the cell to potentially blow up. So we could put water may lyse the cell, meaning make it break or rupture. Okay. The other thing that complement is um, going to be doing, this is its most exciting role, right? Making this membrane attack complex that virtually like, or like just pops holes in the membranes of pathogens. But also complement feeds back to enhance inflammation and phagocytosis. So it makes uh, macrophages more likely to engulf whatever they find. So that's another role that it would have. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about are the different cells that are part of the innate immune system. And the easy way to remember this is that well, if it's not a T cell and it's not a B cell, then it is part of the Im innate immune system. So what I have on here, here is a, I guess I'll, I'll just color this whole thing blue. Um, this is meant to represent uh, antigens that were taken from different things that this encountered. So um, then this is called an antigen presenting cell. You'll learn more about these as we go on in our notes. But these antigen presenting cells can be either macrophages, oops, or what are called dendritic cells. Those are your two best examples there. And they sample things that they find and then they present them to a T cell or a B cell. And for that reason, this is the link with adaptive immunity. It's going to start it. So if you don't have enough antigen presenting cells or they're not working right in your body, then adaptive immunity might not even get started properly. So that's the link there. And then if you go up here, another important uh, couple of cells, take your purple highlighter and put purple dots all over this one. And you might remember at some point learning about basophils and mast cells. And these mast cells in particular are very, very, very plentiful underlying mucous membranes in the tissues. And basophils are a very similar kind of cell that circulates in the blood, but they both release histamine. And histamine causes inflammation. It, it causes the blood vessels to be leaky. So this is going to be an important part of the innate immune response and not surprisingly also highly associated with allergies and other kinds of inappropriate immune responses. Okay, then this next cell is um, natural killer cell. And a natural killer cell is a lymphocyte as opposed to like a T and a B cell, but it's considered part of the innate immune response because it doesn't have to be activated by an antigen presenting cell. We usually call these NK cells. And these are um, well known for attacking virally infected cells and also tumor cells of cancers. Um, and like I said, they're part of the innate immune system because they don't have to be activated the way a T or a B cell does. Okay, then our last two, uh, this one right here is a neutrophil. The neutrophil is sort of the jack of all trades. We have more of these circulating than any other kind of white blood cells. They are phagocytic. They can release bleach and peroxide. Um, they're sort of a jack of all trades kind of useful white blood cell. And then this last one, the eosinophils are very, very rare. And the eosinophils are 
um, especially important in fighting off parasitic worm infections. Uh, that said, they are also, like the mast and the basophil, mast cells and basophils, strongly associated with allergies. Okay, thanks for your attention for this pretty long video. I will see you in the next one.